step up. Those two words became NC State's slogan heading into the 2002 football season. Not only did the Wolfpack step up, it went on to produce the greatest season in school history. Hi, I'm Tony Haynes of the NC State Radio Network, and the commemorative video you're watching looks back on a magnificent year for the Wolfpack, from preseason preparation all the way through the elation of beating Notre Dame in the Toyota Gator Bowl. This is the story of the 2002 NC State Wolfpack. Coming off its second straight bowl game under Coach Amato, the pack knew that expectations coming into year three would be high. The defense would be adopting a new philosophy in the wake of defensive coordinator Buddy Green's departure to Navy. Quarterback Phillip Rivers had proven himself as the man behind center and would be counted on to bring the pack to a higher level going into his junior year. Question marks surrounded blue chip freshman running back T.A. McClendon. After completing a very decorated high school career, could the Albemarle product cut it in the ACC? And if so, when could the pack call him its number one guy? The offensive line got some defensive help, and the pack's receiving core would need someone to, well, step up. Fall camp opened with a bevy of concerns plaguing the pack. Well, the biggest concerns were uh, the offensive line and running back. Uh, I, f I felt we had a chance to be better on defense. We had our kicking people back, but uh, those were the biggest concerns. It was obvious that Coach Amato was not concerned about naming a defensive coordinator since he was comfortable going in with the staff he already had in place. Uh, I, I felt comfortable with the players we had there, and I felt comfortable because for the first time since I was, I've been here, we were able to play things that I wanted to play. And uh, because of personnel, not because of any other reason. But, uh, you know, uh, I had maturity with Joe, with Coach, Coach Pate, <clears throat> and hired maturity with Greg Williams. Really good friends, an outstanding coach. We played together. And I had two young youngsters who are awfully, and, and I, I don't mean that. I mean, Chris isn't a, uh, a baby by any means, but with Chris Demarest and, and Manny Diaz, they and they, they I had been with them for five and six years. They knew me. They knew what I wanted. They knew the adjustments. They knew everything, and and it was a good mix. You know, Chuck is the, the master chef, and we're all the cooks. And you know, he sets the recipe, and then we cook the meals. And as long as he likes the way it tastes, then he's fine. And uh, every now and then, if somebody starts putting too much you know, oregano or paprika, then, you know, then he's got to come in and correct us. With the defensive coaching issue now decided, the next question was, who would be carrying the ball to start the season? Coach Amato made the decision to move Greg Golden from cornerback to tailback. Greg Golden brought, by, by him going over there, <clears throat> he brought an attitude to the offense, you know, that, uh, and you, you, you had that to fill up. It made, made things a little fun and happy over there. You never knew what was going to come out of his mouth. I just didn't want to throw T.A. <clears throat> out there and say, it's yours, we're going to live and die. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to put that pressure on him. And the same thing with Josh Brown. And, and that, it, it served the purpose because Greg was there long enough for the other two to mature. And, and I, I think Greg Goldman, for what he did for this football team, was probably as unselfish a thing as I've ever seen a young man do because he's a, he's a very talented athlete and he's a very talented corner. Uh, and, and, and I hope that the 2002 football season never forgets the name of Greg Golden because it was, it was big what he did. So with Greg Golden as the game one starter, the only question that remained was, who would be opening holes for him? We had moved two defensive players there in Riggs and Locklear. Uh, we had uh, Sean Burton, we had, uh, Willie Wright graduated, and Sean Burton and Joe Gray were fighting it out. But Burton added some to the offense, and, and uh, Riggs added, and, uh, and then uh, uh, Locklear, I mean, you know, they were, the, the offensive line looked like an offensive line, it's supposed to. I knew going in that they were going to, uh, you know, I guess prove people wrong and show that they could be a good offensive line. And, and from game one, they really improved and, and showed that they were a good bunch. With everything now falling into place, it was time to play some football. And all the preseason questions and answers would be played out on the football field 
as the Wolfpack would meet the New Mexico Lobos in the earliest opener in school history. As if letting everyone know that a storm was brewing in Raleigh, the opening game was delayed for 37 minutes as thunderstorms rumbled past Carter Finley Stadium. When the game finally got underway, the Lobos encountered another storm as Phillip Rivers hooked up with Brian Peterson to give the pack a 7-0 lead and an early sign of things to come. Rivers started off right, beginning the season in Heisman-like fashion as he tossed three touchdowns and ran for two more. The pack went on to win 34-14. The game also marked the debut of T.A. McClendon as a college football player. When I first got them, you know, went on the field, I was like, okay, I'm in the game now, you know, T.A., come on, let's get it together. And they called that play. I walked it to the line. At first, I thought I was going to be nervous, but I wasn't. I just felt like it was a regular football game. Then when I got it, you know, things just opened up for me. You know, I went to the left. Bam, I seen the opener. I took it. I spent a little bit and I spent again and then I got tackled. I was like, wow, you know, I got a lot of yards on my first carry. I was, you know, I was real hyper then. So I was ready for it again, you know. Give it to me. I want it, you know. The game two opponent were the Buccaneers from East Tennessee State University. Coming into the contest, the Bucks were a huge underdog against the Wolfpack, and from the very first play of the game, the Pack let the Bucks know why, as Lamont Reed would take the opening kickoff back 90 yards to provide the Pack with the only points it would need for victory. The return marked the first opening kickoff return for a score at NC State since 1957. In the game, Greg Golden scored his first collegiate rushing touchdown and amassed 66 yards on eight carries, including his second TD of the day on a little pack trickery. T.A. McClendon also scored his first touchdown, signaling to pack fans that maybe, just maybe, he could become the starting running back in his freshman year. But first, he would still have to learn the system, and Phillip Rivers would need to lead T.A. through that learning curve. But I was still asking Phillip at the, you know, when we were going up to the line, hey, What's the play? You know, I'm doing things like that. Hey, Phil, what's the play? He telling me what to do. So if I if it weren't for Phil, I mean, he would, he'd have been real hurt, you know. So I'm glad he helped out, you know, because if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have known to pick this linebacker up, to to block this D end, to do this swing route, to check down here. So Phil, he's he's a leader in my eye and to the whole team. So you know, what I'm saying we can continue to love him. In the end, the Pack shut out the Buccaneers 34 to nothing as the stingy defense allowed only 81 total offensive yards. And it was at this point that the coaches started to see a young defense emerging as a dominant force. I felt good about what I saw defensively. I really felt good, and I've said since I've been here, we're not going to be great until we play great defense consistently. We felt like this, was, this had to be the year where we just stopped being good enough on defense and we learned what it was like to dominate somebody. Game three would turn out to be the most lopsided victory of the season as the pack jumped all over the Navy midshipmen. In less than four minutes, NC State led 21 to nothing as Phillip Rivers connected with Brian Peterson on a 64-yard touchdown pass. On the ensuing kickoff, Lamont Reed pounced on a Navy fumble and raced 30 yards to put the pack up by two touchdowns. When Navy finally lined up as an offensive unit, it gave the opportunistic pack defense another present as Jarek Hall recovered an errant pitch to give NC State possession. A few seconds later, Rivers hooked up with Sterling Hicks, and the pack was on a roll. You know, it was just one of those games where uh, everything you called was open, and, uh, and you just felt confident, and you had time, and uh, it was just one of those games you get off to a big start and we never slowed down. Rivers had himself a career day, tossing five touchdowns, which tied his own school record. He also rushed for another, solidifying his name in the NC State history book. Phillip, he just got, uh, you know, just the, the, the intangibles, the leadership, the, the will to win that he brings to the, you know, to the table is just unmatched from anybody I've ever been around. Here's a young man who weighed 203 pounds uh, three years ago, coming in here as a, as a true freshman, as a high school senior, actually, when he got here, and, uh, and has started our program, and now after three and a half years, weighs 237 and nearly bench presses 400 pounds and never misses a workout, 
and is probably as consistent as anyone on our football team in terms of his work ethic. And, and that's why he's great. You know, in the coaching profession, we talk about kids that have it, and he, he's got it. He just finds a way to get it done, and uh, he adjusts and, and just finds a way to get it done and, and puts us in a position to win football games. Well, what makes Phillips so great is he's just the all-around package. Uh, mentally, he's as sharp as there is in the game, I believe, and when he gets to the next level, he'll be amongst the top two or three guys mentally at that level, too. He's got tremendous poise and composure. He's wise beyond his years. He's extremely composed, and, uh, and then he's, he's just a great person, too. The Navy game also saw Terrence Holt block his 10th and 11th kicks to equal the ACC mark set by Duke's Ray Farmer. With the sinking of the midshipmen, the pack would look forward to its first real challenge of the year and its first conference game against the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. Game four featured Wake's unorthodox rushing attack, which to this point in the season was producing 260 rushing yards per game. Yeah, Wake Forest, um, they really always play um, North Carolina State tough. Even I can remember my freshman year when they, we went to Wake Forest and they just they ran the ball all over. So they always come out with those tough blocking schemes, cut blocking, doing all that. So we knew when they came in the car to feeling they was really going to really come after us uh, and, and try to uh, smash them off. But we really took the fight to them on defense. NC State took the early lead on a five-yard touchdown pass to Jericho Cotric. And although Wake would battle back, the pack would stand tall as T.A. McClendon and Greg Golden did a little running of their own with T.A. crossing the goal line twice and convincing the coaching staff that he could indeed be a starter for this pack team. It was Sean Price who issued the final statement. He crushed Wake Forest James McPherson, causing a fumble, which Price then took to daylight. That play was, was huge. You know, you sack the quarterback, you cause him to fumble it, you pick up the football and you run it in the end zone for a touchdown. That was really big against a Wake Forest team that as we find out at the end of the year when they went to the bowl game and played Oregon, who at one point was sixth in the country, and Wake whacked them really good. So it was, it was, it was huge, and it showed that we did have youngsters that could make plays. In a game that proved the pack had punch, a knockdown king took center stage. Terrence Holt, who had made a name for himself as an outstanding defensive player and by knocking down kicks, set an all-time ACC record for block kicks. His 12th career block, moved him past Ray Farmer as the all-time ACC blocked kick leader. Here's a young man that we had the opportunity to make a big play in the kicking game. I mean, there were times that you could sense, the crowd could sense that he was going to block a kick, you know, and it just added a little more jump to his, to his jump, and, 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 and uh, uh, it, it was, it was kind of neat, and it couldn't happen to a better person. I wish there were more Holtz that were ready to play football in the college level. It was just great playing with this guy because he always, you know when he go out there on special teams, he's going to give everything he got. You know, it's a great feeling to have that record. Uh, you know, I was blocking all those kicks trying to keep uh, teams from scoring points on us, so it does go as uh, far as, to me, defensive, uh, you know, stops. So it's, you know, it, it's all the same for me as far as defense and special teams. So, But it's a great feeling to to have that racket and have my name on, on yet another racket. At 4-0, NC State still had its detractors, and a matchup against the high-flying Texas Tech Red Raiders was next. The talk going into the Texas Tech game focused on freshman running back T.A. McClendon, who was finally slated to get his first start at tailback. Greg Golden returned to defense and T.A. was ready to show the world that his time had come. Unfortunately, though, he would literally fail to answer the bell on his first start. Make that the bell on his alarm clock. Well, we got up for breakfast. All right, down in Texas, you know, we got up for breakfast. It was like still dark outside. There wasn't nobody out. When I got up, I looked out the window. There was nobody out. And like, I was still tired. But I went down there, I ate breakfast, and Coach was talking to me and stuff. And he was like, you know, we're going to gonna try to get you in there and start the game. I was like, you know, word, yeah. I was ready. And then like, we had a little time to kill in between there and the time we left. And so I was like, well, I'm gonna just lay down for a minute. And like, I actually had my alarm set, but I didn't hear it. <laughs> 
And so I had people knocking on my door, calling me, you know, alarm going off at the same time. I think I was just dead tired. But, you know, I redeemed myself and later on, you know. <laughs> we always get T.A. a hard time because he always sleeping. He, he sleeps on the way to the game and, and things like that, so he, he gets enough rest. He was late for the bus. But we told him that was that was something that we planned because we knew we were going to go in overtime. We wanted to give him that little, little extra sleep. And he, I mean, he rambled against a, a really good team. Fortunately for NC State fans, the rest of the Wolfpack did answer the alarm bell, and T.A. McClendon would have a chance to redeem himself during an old-fashioned Texas shootout. I knew we were going there on turf. It was different for us. I mean, it was just going to be a tough trip. You'd been hearing all week about you know, it could be a shootout, and, and of course, Kingsbury is a great quarterback, and they do have a great offense, so we were prepared to score as many points as we needed to. On a very hot day, the Pack and Red Raiders would battle the heat and each other. It was hot. You know, I've got to put my sunscreen on, so I got a little bit uh, uh, tanner than what I normally would, but it, it's, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a hot day. Exhausted, yes, but happy. The Pack came out of the block strong and took a 17-10 lead into the half. When the second half began, the 16th ranked Wolfpack jumped out to a seemingly insurmountable lead as T.A. McClendon ran roughshod all over the Red Raiders. Sean Price discovered that he liked scoring touchdowns as he scored his second of the season in consecutive games when he took a Cliff Kingsbury fumble the distance. The pack was well on its way to 5-0, leading 38-10 when Mr. Momentum took a seat on the Texas Tech sideline. Early in the second half, we jumped on them quick, got to a, a real big lead, and then it seemed like it was just a total nightmare. I mean, they just start scoring, just scoring, and scoring. Kingsbury settled in and brought the Red Raiders storming back into the game. With just over eight minutes to play, Kingsbury connected with wideout Mickey Peters to pull the Red Raiders within a touchdown at 38 to 31. With the hometown crowd loud, Rivers connected with Jericho Cotri on a 72-yard bomb that set up yet another T.A. McClendon touchdown, which seemed to put the finishing touches on the outcome. However, the Red Raiders refused to go quietly into the night and came storming back to score two touchdowns and not the game at 45 when Teron Henderson and Anton Page each tallied touchdowns. The Red Raiders managed to deny the Pack's offensive unit and got the ball into scoring position with just 34 ticks left on the clock. Robert Treese lined up for the game-winning field goal, but the kick sailed wide and the Pack had new life. He missed that field goal and like, oh, this is our game now. So we were like rejuvenated when he missed that field goal and we like, we know we can win this game. NC State would not allow the disappointment or the oppressive Texas heat to damper its spirits heading into the overtime. We had to fight back and end up, uh, you know, defending ourselves. We knew once we got them in the overtime, we settled down and, and got into our base defense, and that really just that really made everybody feel comfortable because we was running a, a, a prowler defense that we really didn't get a chance to, um, to play to play using it during the game. So when we got in our regular defense, we really felt like we uh, we can win the game. In the overtime, the pack defense would hold, allowing only a Trees field goal to put the Raiders up 48-45. But NC State would not settle for a field goal, and T.A. McClendon would not be stopped. We felt like, you know, and, and hearing from our guys, Comer and Riggs and those guys saying, we can run it. Well, we, you know, we can get, they're tired and, and they were blocking them good. And, uh, you know, and T.A. was rolling right there at that time. And, you know, I felt like that was a good call, you know, to our sideline and uh, the way he was running. Let's see if we can go ahead and pound it and, and finish the game. Phil was like, hey, I think, I think he said we need three yards. And I, was just, I just looked at him in his eyes and I said, you know, I'm ready, you know, I'm ready to win. I, I don't like to lose, so I'm, I'm ready to win. And then when he gave it to me, I went around the corner. I didn't even see the, you know, how many yards I got. I just seen like I cut behind the, my tight ends, and I seen them. I just jumped. I seen the end zone. I just jumped and stretched my arm as far as I can. And they, when they called the touchdown, I was just like, you know, wow. That you know, I, I I won the game. You know, we won the game. You know, I helped out. It was me, and I and I really couldn't believe I had five touchdowns either. It had the game with the touchdown, so. It just hit me all together. The pack had survived one of the greatest shootouts in school history. T.A. McClendon had put his stamp on the starting job by rushing for 150 yards and tying a school record with five rushing touchdowns to match Stan Fritz's 1972 mark. It was a good win for the pack. You know, it was a tough game mentally, you know, trying to get off the field as far as defense, but 
uh, we sucked it up and got the win. That was another step in the chemistry of this football team, of not, not giving up. It's a 60-minute football game. In that case, it was a little longer than 60 minutes. But the bottom line is the bottom score. You know, people say, well, oh, gosh, man, they came back, and well, how are we going to stop these teams? I said, Let's take the game and take the score and go the opposite direction. Let the fourth quarter be the first, and the third quarter be the second. We go in the locker room, we're losing. And the second be the third, and the first be the fourth. And then we made a great comeback. And if you take the game in that perspective, and we win in overtime, you would be so happy, you know, because, uh, but the game was still only 60 minutes. And it's, it's all a perception. And, and, and uh, that, but that was, that was a big, that was big. The shootout with Texas Tech featured several Phillip Rivers and Jericho Cotri connections as this lethal pairing began to blossom. Some kind of way, me and Phil, we just always be on the same page, and and he he knows that. And when when we line up, you know, we kind of give each other the look, you know, that look how this guy is playing me and, and things like that. Reliable. I mean, in a lot of other words, uh, can go along that are compliments to him. He's a uh, he's a great player. He's a uh, you know, early, I, I, early in his career and in my career, I made the comment he's a possession receiver, and I'm not so sure he's the big play possession. He's all, he's every uh, definition uh, that you can put by a wide receiver. He, you know, I've coached an awful lot of kids that were number one round draft picks and and that kind of thing, but I don't know if I've ever coached a kid that works as hard as Jericho Cotri and got the kind of work ethic that he has. I don't know how fast he is exactly, but he's fast enough. You know what they say? He can't run fast, but he plays fast, and he's a lot faster than what people think. Uh, you know, you got a lot of kids out there that have world class, uh, world class track speed that don't play fast. He's a kid that puts a helmet on and shoulder pads and, and plays fast. I know about my field speed. I, I hate the track. I hate the track, and I hate all those timing and timing the forties and things like that. But I know in the field that I can, I can run with the best of them. You know, like I say, he's just a special kid that's worked his tail off. He's got a great. Uh, relationship with Philip Rivers and Philip has an awful lot of confidence in Jericho and it seemed like last year whenever we need a big play that those two found a way to get it done. That relationship we have and not only just the knack for the game and knowing how to play that position that he has makes him so great. Against UMass, NC State had an opportunity to do some tweaking both offensively and defensively and for the most part the pack was able to accomplish most of its goals but let's face it with a big game against our rival North Carolina looming the very next week, NC State had to avoid the trap of overlooking Massachusetts. While the pack would roll to a 56-24 victory, highlighted by the second kickoff return of the year and two more touchdowns for T.A. McClendon in his first official start, a sluggish overall performance would bring out the naysayers and doubters who focused on the pack's less-than-stellar performance on the defensive side of the ball, something that had Coach Amato talking upset. Look at the number of people on that same weekend that were undefeated and got upset by somebody that, I mean, big upset. And but we didn't get upset. Oh, we upset people. We upset some sports writers. We upset people sitting in the stands. But the bottom line is we won. We won. It's, and and, and that's, that's the ultimate, is winning. In the end, the victory made NC State 6-0 with its third 50-plus point performance of the season, which was the first time this feat had been accomplished at State since 1973. For Game 7, NC State traveled over to Chapel Hill for a game against the arch-rival Tar Heels. However, on this day, Keenan Stadium looked more like Carter-Finley Stadium West as an infusion of red-clad Wolfpack supporters made their way into the stands. But after all, Coach Amato had encouraged Pack fans to wear their colors proudly in hostile territory. Don't you be intimidated by going to an opposing team's stadium and wearing red and white outwardly, not just inwardly, and because that's big. And boy, do our fans show that. They did it in football. They've done it in basketball over there and and because that's the wolf pack fans the pack came out on fire against its rivals marching 80 yards to score the game's first points when t.a mcclendon was introduced to the carolina versus state rivalry but carolina would answer back with a 29 yard field goal from dan orner and then take the lead when darian durant hooked up with tight end bobby blizzard 
Down by three at the half, NC State had to regroup and re-examine its game plan. The coaching staff knew that North Carolina was vulnerable against the run. So, in the second half, it was time for plan B, and the Wolfpack ran the football over and over again. When it returned to the field, the Wolfpack would fall behind 17 to seven when Darian Durant connected with James Faison on a five-yard touchdown. But then NC State responded by ramming the ball down Carolina's throat as it turned the tide of the game and dominated the line of scrimmage. We were just bigger and stronger than North Carolina, and our kids really believed that we could pound them and knock them off the football. And once we got it going in the second half with two or three runs out of a two tight end set, it was going so good that, that we just said, why abandon it? You know, we said, let's establish a run, let's run it right at them. And uh, that's what we started doing in, in the third quarter, and it was working, and I was saying, let's keep running it. You know, I, I was looking over Coach Holiday saying, keep, let's keep running it. They, they were tired. They were, they were yelling at each other. They were hunching over. They were just, just looking at the sideline like, Coach, get us out. Phillip Rivers would mark the turning of the tide when he scrambled into the end zone to bring the pack within four at 17 to 13. Then the wheels came off the baby blue bus when quarterback Darian Durant coughed the ball up on the ensuing Carolina possession into the hungry hands of D'Antonio Burnett, who gave the pack a first and goal from the Carolina four. And when you have first and goal on the Carolina four, all you have to do is give the rock to touchdown anytime T.A. McClendon. Just like that, the pack had grabbed a 20 to 17 lead and would not let Carolina back into the game. In the fourth quarter, the Wolfpack smelled blood in the air as it poured it on. Rivers gave State some breathing room by hitting Brian Peterson to make it 27 to 17. Then Josh Brown slapped an exclamation point on victory as he scampered 12 yards to give the pack the game's final score. NC State had run over the Tar Heels en route to a 34 to 17 win, tying the best start in the school's 111 year football history and dominating its biggest rival on their home field. You know, when the offense is out there and they can drive the ball and do the great things they were able to do, and to do it against that team, Carolina, is, you know, a great feeling um, to shove it down their face. T.A. McClendon had experienced his first rival game against the Heels and had played a key role in his team's victory. I'm playing for the state, so, you know, of course, beating them felt good if it's a rival. But when you always beat your rival team, you know, that's, that's like the greatest feeling in the world, but beating them at their house, you know, that's, that feels even better. Because I know a lot of people is like, you know, Carolina got a great team, and I'm pretty sure they do. But, you know, we went down there and made them not look so well. <laughs> made them not look so well. You know, Dukes, uh, you, just in the past, you think of Duke football, you think you're going to win the game. And uh, that's not the case anymore. Uh, they got some good athletes, good players, and I think you know Coach Franks does a great job over there with, with them. The Blue Devils have struggled in recent years, but always seem to bring their best into a battle with NC State, and this game was no exception. On the Wolfpack's first drive of the game, Rivers hustled into the end zone from six yards out to score the game's first touchdown. And while Phillip would go on to pass for 364 yards and two touchdowns, the Blue Devils would stick around for the entire game. We kind of got the passing game going there for a while, and you know they had a good game plan and they played well. And uh, I don't think we played as well as we could have. With the game close in the fourth, the dynamic duo of Rivers and Jericho Cotry hooked up again on a 53-yard touchdown that put the pack up 24 to 15 with two minutes and 52 seconds left in the game. You know, it came down late in the game. We we hit him on our famous hard count. You know, try to draw him off sides and hit Jericho on a long touchdown, and then you think the game's over. But the Blue Devils would not die. Sophomore quarterback Adam Smith methodically moved his team down the field and brought Duke within two points of the pack when he found wide receiver Kari Sharp behind the secondary for a 40-yard score. With less than 30 seconds remaining, the Devils had no choice but to go for an onside kick. After an intense scrum for the football and with 14 seconds remaining, the Blue Devils recovered the kick and were on the Wolfpack 49. Duke kicker Brent Garber had already booted field goals from 45 and 47 yards in the game, so the pack was far from out of the woods. After failing to get closer, Duke lined up for the winning 65-yard field goal attempt with seconds remaining on the clock. I tell you what, I don't know how long that field goal was, 60-something yards, but I wasn't so sure it was over. Even when he was lining up to kick that thing, it was uh, bothering me a little bit on the sideline. The Wolfpack crowd was dancing on pins and needles, trying to will a Terrence Holt blocked kick. 
I knew it was going to be from Far Out, but I knew if, if I didn't get my hands on it or someone got their hands on it, then, then you know, he has a possibility of making it. And I didn't want to, you know, end my career losing to Duke, nor we didn't want to stop the streak there by losing to Duke. So, um, you know, I was definitely thinking about if it was any time that I needed to get one, it would be that. In the end, the ball wobbled to the ground after hitting a Duke lineman, and the Wolfpack was 8-0 for only the second time in school history. Yeah, it gets, sure got scary at the end. <clears throat> Give up a big pass and for a touchdown, and they get an onside kick and, and everything else. And, and uh, yeah, we were, I was, there's no question I was concerned because you know what? Sooner or later, they were going to beat somebody. And, and uh, that would have been so fitting for them to beat somebody at that point that hadn't lost a game. And, uh, but we got over that hurdle. We got over that hurdle and we went to the next one. Following that extremely close win over Duke, the NC State critics became extremely vocal, claiming that the pack was nothing more than a BCS pretender. Despite rising to number nine in the national polls, they claimed that State still hadn't played anybody and that the upcoming game against Clemson would reveal the real Wolf Pack. You know, people were calling us frauds, you know, in Chicago and Los Angeles. And, and uh, uh, the bottom line is we were they know. I mean, so what? You know, and, and every time we won a game, they said, well, wait till you play that team. And then, and then when you went out, and then, well, we didn't play that team. And, and people were so scared to death because, we, cause, because of the Duke game and the pass. And here's Clemson, which is pass happy. And, and our kids went down there in five, in, with five days of preparation and played the best total game. The Clemson faithful filled Death Valley, and the pack was greeted with the loudest opposition crowd it would face all year. I think I like that type of environment. It was, it was fun to me, seeing all those people. You're like, wow, because I've never played in front of that big of a crowd before. So when you go out there, you know, you just got the drum and pumping, and so you know you're on their home field, so they just looking to just kill you. <laughs> but we didn't even. We didn't think about it that way. It was like, we're going to beat these guys today, no matter what. It was time for NC State to answer its critics. It was on a Thursday night on ESPN with the nation watching that the pack proved a point. We really uh, went into that Clemson game with a chip on our shoulder. We really felt like nobody, nobody, any, any, no team in the country respected us, not even the media. I mean, they was talking about our schedule, um, how weak our schedule was. Uh, Coach Bowen, all the different coaches, they were saying that we really hadn't played anybody in an elite course, so he was saying, like, when we meet Clemson, we really were going to get a real test, and they, they was going to, like, beat us up all over the field, but we really went out there and just took it to them. In the first quarter, Manny Lawson would block a punt that would set the tone for the entire game. Well, that was huge, and it was, in that game, that was real big, and, and for a freshman, a freshman, but we got that, you know, that's going to, going to be something else, Manny Lawson. Terrence Holt scooped the ball up and ran 39 yards to put the pack up by six. I've been dreaming about that play for ever since I blocked one back in Texas game, uh, you know, being the guy to uh, come on the recipient end and scoop the ball and score. And I knew uh, once I seen it on the turf, I wasn't going to fall on it. Um, Coach Pate does a great job of us. If the ball's behind the line of scrimmage, that try to scoop it, it's going to be our ball anyway. And, you know, I just scooped it and, and, and seen the cavalry ahead of me, and I knew that I was going to make it to the end zone. On the ensuing extra point attempt, Coach Amato dipped into his bag of tricks to further quiet the crowd, sending Wolfpack holder Chris Young dashing for the two-point conversion, and the pack led by eight. On the next NC State possession, Clemson forced the pack into a fourth-and-one situation. Feeling his team couldn't be stopped, Coach Amato gave T.A. McClendon the football, and 31 yards later, it was a 15 to nothing Wolfpack advantage. Just like that, the 80,000 Death Valley partisans fell into a deep hush. Phillip Rivers would put a resounding stamp on the first half when he crossed the goal line from a yard out to give the pack a 22 nothing halftime advantage. In the second half, the pack played possession football and hopped onto the back of T.A. McClendon. The freshman back would cross the goal line again and would end the game with a career high 178 yards rushing. The Tigers could not muster an offense against the Pack's defense as D'Antonio Burnett and his teammates kept the Clemson offense on its heels. The lone Clemson score would come on a kickoff return after T.A. McClendon's second touchdown. 
with the scoreboard reading 31-6 in the fourth quarter. The Tigers had no choice but to attempt the onside kick. This week, however, the Pack had a new plan in place. Jericho Cotri took the ball on the first bounce and bounded for 44 untouched yards as he and the Wolfpack drove the stake through Clemson's heart. The entire country witnessed an official NC statement. The Wolfpack was 9-0 for the first time ever and was looking forward to its first double-digit victory season. With four games left, it seemed all but a certainty. For the first time in 2002, adversity would strike a cruel blow to the Wolfpack team and its dreams for an unbeaten season. And those hopes for a national championship, well, they went up in smoke as well following the first loss of the season. Georgia Tech and NC State would trade blows in this bout like heavyweight boxers. The pack came from behind to take a 10-9 lead in the third. Ironically, the game's momentum would shift to the Jackets following one of their own mistakes. Early in the fourth quarter, with the Jackets pinned down deep in their own territory at the 16-yard line and looking at third and long, the crowd drowned out an official's whistle, while the pack's defense smashed Georgia Tech's A.J. Suggs for a loss that would have Tech punting out of its own end zone. Instead, it was a delay of game call that made it third and 19. On the very next play, Suggs would connect with Jonathan Smith for 28 yards and a Georgia Tech first down. The drive would culminate in a touchdown to Tech's John Paul Foshi, tying the game after a two-point conversion. Suddenly, the Jackets owned the momentum. The Yellow Jackets would take the lead for good on a Gordon Clink scale run and the Wolfpack had been saddled with its first loss of the year. It was a, a real hurt feeling because everybody on the team knew that we, we, we knew we was the better team, that we had let a game slip away. Um, it definitely was a tough loss, you know, to think, think about, you know, what was in stake. You know, we were on a, uh, a streak there. I think we were number eight or number seven, something like that in the country. And we knew if we got a loss that it was going to be tougher in the polls. It, it definitely was a tough loss, and we, we felt we let down our fans. We lost at home um, being this game, and just coming off a great showing at Clemson like that, um, it, it was definitely tough to deal with, but we knew we had to come back and um, bounce back. NC State would come into the Maryland game suffering from a first-loss hangover, looking to shake the effects of the Georgia Tech game. And once again, the Wolfpack was quick to pounce as Phillip Rivers hooked up with his favorite receiver, Jericho Cotri, on the game's first score. State then found the end zone for another touchdown to put the pack up 14 to nothing. And Maryland would respond with a reverse play that went 64 yards to go into the half trailing 14 to seven. But bad news was brewing in the locker room for NC State. McClendon would not be able to play in the second half after re-injuring a sore shoulder in the latter stages of the second quarter. It just hurt me that I couldn't go out there because I felt like I could help him. And I know I couldn't go back in the game, so I couldn't do nothing but encourage him, you know, keep it up, man, you know what I'm saying? You're doing a good job. You know what I'm saying? Keep running the ball, JB. You know, keep on, keep it up, Phil. And like, I was just crying like the whole time, man, because I know I couldn't go back out there. It, it hurt me, just like, just because I couldn't go out there. It, that's like one of the worst feelings. With T.A. down, NC State looked to back up Josh Brown, who combined with McClendon had formed a thunder and lightning running attack for the pack. And lightning would strike six minutes into the third as Brown scampered across the goal line to put State up 21 to seven. But again, Maryland would answer back in front of its hometown fans as tailback Bruce Perry capped off a 70 yard drive to bring the Terrapins within seven. The pack then put together another march that would culminate in a 30-yard field goal attempt by Adam Kiker, but the kick sailed wide right and Maryland had new life. The Terps would turn right around and tie the game on a 21-yard keeper by quarterback Scott McBride. Maryland would deny the pack on its next offensive possession, and with 34 seconds remaining, Nick Novak put the decisive points on the scoreboard with a game-winning boot. NC State looked to turn things around against Al Groh's improving Virginia Cavaliers. UVA jumped out to a 7-0 lead as Otto Anderson caught a 21-yard strike from quarterback Matt Schaub. The Wolfpack would narrow the margin with a 27-yard Adam Kiker field goal to make it 7-3 going into the third quarter. In the third, 
Schaub hooked up with Patrick Estes to push the Cavaliers' lead to 14-3. But Rivers would run the ball in to make it 14-9 after the pack failed to convert the extra point. State kept fighting, and with time ticking down, it marched down the field to the Virginia 15. On fourth down, Rivers tried to find Peterson in the end zone, but the senior receiver could only get his fingertips on the football before a crowded UVA secondary converged. NC State had dropped its third straight game, and each loss had gone right down to the wire. Those dreams of a double-digit win season began to slip out of focus with the ACC leading Florida State Seminoles next up. Uh, how things can go from so high to so low, and to lose those games, not even lose them. You know, a loss is a loss if you lose about one point, but to be in those games and one point be ahead in those games, if not right there tied with those teams is just uh, totally uh, devastating to lose by that short amount of points and um, we, we were just distraught but we knew as seniors we had to to bounce back once again. We could go back and not change anything that we called in that particular game and if we just lined up and eliminated the penalties and made plays we call them MOs which are missed opportunities and you know in those three particular games you know we had kids in position to make plays we just didn't get it done and that happens I mean you know, you eliminate the MOs or missed opportunities, eliminate the penalties, and eliminate the turnovers. We win all three of those games. Coach Amato certainly knew he had to refocus his team after sensing that his players were feeling sorry for themselves. You know, when you're 9-0, you think you're really good, and when you're 0-3 uh, in 21 days of work, and, and with facing a Florida State, you're saying you, you can start to question yourself. And, and I, I sensed that on, on Monday after practice. I went home, and I, and I just knew I could sense and that Tuesday before we went out in the field, I called a team meeting before we went out the field, which I've, I don't normally do, and I want everybody in there, the coaches, players, trainers, managers, and we just put it out, hey, man, it's about time we stop feeling sorry for ourselves. We're going to play Florida State whether we like it or not, and just guess what? They're going to be upset because of what happened a year ago. I said, yeah, and, and, and uh, we, 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 we can't have another practice like we did last night. Uh, and it, and it, it really put a sense of urgency in, in everybody. And the coaches, and I told coaches, stop feeling sorry for yourself. You know, do your job and put these youngsters into the best position we can to win a football game. And uh, we, had, you could sense it starting to come. You know, at that point that we we were ready, and then we really played well. Needless to say, Florida State has one of the greatest programs in college football history. And when they came here to Carter-Finley Stadium, the Knolls were looking for a little revenge. After all, the Pack had beaten them in Tallahassee the year before, becoming the first ACC team to do so. And no ACC team had beaten Florida State in back-to-back -back years since they joined the league in the early 90s. Hey, the table was set for an FSU win, right? I mean, NC State had lost three in a row, but it didn't work out that way. It was homecoming here at Carter-Finley, and seniors like D'Antonio Burnett wanted to go out in style. To know about Dan, you know, uh, I have to tell you this. When I coached in high school, I coached against Conrad Nick, his high school coach, for several years. And then we stayed in touch. He called me. Uh, I didn't, you know, we didn't know who Dan Burnett was. He's from, you know, South Georgia, Warner Robins, and we weren't really recruiting that area, you know, real heavily. And he said he had a kid he wanted us to look at. He said, uh, not only is he the best linebacker that I've ever coached, but he's the best football player. And he said, Joe, he said, uh, I'll promise you this, he'll be a captain. And, you know, that's just, uh, that's the way it worked out. And he, Dan, is just uh, a really, really one of the most special young men on the field and off the field that I've had the privilege of being around. The biggest thing that Dan has is, is it. He has the it that Coach Amato will talk about when he looks at for that in a player, and that's heart, that's character between your ears, that's work ethic, uh, and desire. So Thunder Dan Burnett and the pack defense would go out and put on quite a display. Dominating the game on defense, the Wolf Pack would take a 3-0 lead into the second quarter when a rare special teams error would prove costly. On a fake field goal attempt, Chris Young fumbled, and the ball was scooped up by FSU's Michael Boulware, who rambled 84 yards to give the Seminoles a 7-3 lead. But as stunning as that play was, this one was far from being over. 
T.A. McClendon would become only the fifth freshman in ACC history to surpass the 1,000-yard rushing plateau as he would run for 114 yards, including a six-yard jaunt to the end zone that would put the pack up for good. That was like one of the best feelings in the world. You know, I, I felt good because it was my first Florida State win as a player. So, so I was just real happy, real happy. In the fourth quarter, the defense that had the Seminoles baffled came away with two safeties as FSU was called for a hold in the end zone before Manny Lawson blocked a punt that bounced beyond the back line for two more points. We shut them out pretty good. It was, you know, a great day for us defensively as well as offensively and coaching staff and a great day for our fans because not only did we beat them, and it wasn't like no luck win. We dominated them to totally all game. The NC State defense owned the Seminoles on this day, and the linebacker that had many teams questioning whether he could even play football on this level would provide the exclamation point, setting off a frenzy at Carter-Finley Stadium. Talk, we knew, we just had to call, we knew we was gonna go out there and win. It was just how, how much and how uh, we were gonna do it. And uh, just ending that, in, the way we ended the game with the interception, me picking the ball off that end, at the end of the game, it was like a storybook ending because I told him I was going to get an interception at the end of the game. And like all the fans, and before the game was even over, all the fans um, came out on the field. So it was just, it was just, it was huge, man. I couldn't sleep the whole night. It was so special. The Wolfpack had defeated the Florida State Seminoles for the second consecutive season. NC State's defense controlled the game from start to finish and wound up the season as the number one ranked defense in the ACC. The victory caused the Wolfpack faithful to flow onto the field in joyous celebration. It was a great win and the fans deserved it and the players deserved it and everybody deserved it. While they were snatching down the goal post, I was helping more fans onto the field. Where it was a couple of girls, they picked me up, uh, uh, help me down here, help me down here. And I, I helped by, I say about eight, eight girls down onto the field and the guys had to jump down their cells, so <laughs> it was fun for me. After that, I, I just kind of got lost in the crowd because fans were mugging me. That was an exciting win. That definitely you know, ranks up there in, in my top couple of wins. And uh, doing it two years in a row, plus at home, and uh, you know, being, being the last home game for those seniors and seeing the uh, you know, perfect way for them to, to go out. It's a strange feeling because you really want to beat Florida State. You really want to beat Coach Bowden. You, you really want to, and then when it happens, you, you're happy, but you almost feel sorry for Coach Bowden. You, 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 you really do. But uh, I hope we can feel sorry a lot more in the future, too. I, I hope we get to the point when we win a game here that it's not always knock the goalpost down. That maybe it will become that we're supposed to win games. Not that we don't, you know, we save the school a little bit of money for not putting another goalpost up. But uh, it, was, it was delirium, and, and you know what? So what? You know, everybody deserved it at that point. Everybody deserved it. We won our our tenth game, the first time in the history of the school that, 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 that in over a hundred years of football that a football team has won double-digit football games, whether it was regular season, regular season plus a bowl or whatever. And we had done so many things, and to do it against that team, who's the team of the '90s, uh, against that coach and those players and that team that we knew was going to be very upset when they came here. Uh, to do it in the, the manner in which we did it will just make it uh, even more so to, that 10 years from now, probably Florida State, when they, our people, kids come back 10 years from now, Florida State would have negative yards, you know, uh, as opposed to just 160 some yards. The Wolfpack had completed the best regular season in school history and had finally grabbed the coveted double-digit win total, finishing up at 10-3. and three. Five NC State players were named to the 2002 All-ACC team, marking the highest total for the pack in over a decade. T.A. McClendon, tight end Sean Burton, and wide receiver Jericho Cotri on the offensive side, and D'Antonio Burnett and Terrence Holt on the defense. The pack also tallied 19 ACC Player of the Week honors to surpass any other league team. Freshman tailback T.A. McClendon was named the ACC Rookie of the Year and a Sporting News All-America. Joining T.A. on the Sporting News honor roll was the newly anointed ACC Blocked Kicks leader Terrence Holt. Wide receiver Jericho Cotri would end the season leading the ACC in receiving yards per game at 85.1 and Phillip Rivers would cap off his junior year as the winningest junior quarterback in the nation, along the way setting the school record for career touchdowns. 
With the regular season now over, it was bowl selection waiting time. But NC State didn't have to wait very long because the Toyota Gator Bowl jumped at the opportunity to have the Wolfpack in Jacksonville, Florida on New Year's Day. It was really exciting to, to get that call and, and to know it was official, but I'd been getting about 24 hours early, I'd gotten a call that kind of led me to believe that was the direction they thought they were going in. They'd make the decision the next morning when their group met, but that was kind of what they, they were feeling like they were going to do. And so we were excited about hearing the first call and then kind of expecting the actual official call. The selection made Chuck Amato only the fourth coach in ACC history to earn a bowl appearance in each of his first three seasons. As the college football season drew to a close, NC State would have to wait a little while to find out exactly who its opponents would be in the Toyota Gator Bowl. Then it was finally announced that the Notre Dame Fighting Irish would oppose NC State on New Year's Day. Notre Dame had a chance for the national championship until, like the Wolfpack, it fell out of contention with a couple of late season losses. But for Chuck Amato and his Wolfpack, it was a dream come true to have a chance to face college football's most storied program. It doesn't get any better than that. To play a team that North Carolina State's never played before in football, to play it on January 1st at 12.30 kickoff, not really fighting other games. We're kind of in between some and whatever the early starts. Uh, most people are, by this time, the hangovers are over from New Year's Eve. And, uh, but everybody's going to watch Notre Dame. I mean, that game was watched in Australia, in Germany, you know, the South Pole. My family in Sicily watched it. You know, everybody, everybody watched that game. And, and, and we go there and we're the other team. Because Notre Dame, uh, three weeks prior to that, was thinking they were going to go to Fiesta Bowl. Then when that kind of fell through, they were thinking they were going to go to the Orange Bowl. And then they would go to the Gator Bowl and play who? You know, NC who? And uh, uh, it was uh, a great honor because Notre Dame, since the time they started football, has won 75% of their football games. That's big. That is huge. Facing the Fighting Irish had a special significance to Phillip Rivers. You know, a neat thing for me was my granddad sent me an email uh, a couple days before that said his first Notre Dame game, I think, if I remember right, it was in 1951, I think. Uh, he said he paid something like eight, I don't know, something, you know, $10 for a ticket or something like that. And, uh, you know, he was sat there by himself. He drove up with a buddy, I think, and, uh, and he was telling me how this game, you know, it's going to be all my family there and I'll be playing against Notre Dame. So it was just neat. The Gator Bowl Selection Committee knew that the Pack Faithful would travel to see their team play. They just didn't know that by inviting the Wolf Pack to their bowl, they were converting Jacksonville, Florida into Raleigh South for an entire week. Droves of Wolfpack fans piled into their cars and converged onto Jacksonville in support of their team. I had told him, I said, now, when they start coming in town, I was talking about Wolfpackers. When they show up, you'll know they're here. And of course, they, they, you know, they said, yeah, yeah, we're sure. Because I'd gone in early eight days before or something. And sure enough, they started. Uh, they knew the situation they had because they couldn't get tents big enough for our Booster Club to meet is probably the largest Wolfpack gathering ever in one area in, in, in certain space. And so, you know, they knew what was coming as the week went on and on and on. And then when they started seeing them rolling into town, and I think probably the most fun thing was hearing from fans that were coming that actually called me on their cell phones telling me about how the interstate looked on 95 coming down there. That, you know, you'd hear every fifth car, every six cars a Wolfpack flag, and we're all yelling at each other and so that was really a neat thing because it was almost like you know a war was coming. A war was indeed on the horizon. By beating Florida State, NC State had proven it could take it to the next level and overcome adversity. Now it was time to prove to the entire nation that this was a football team that was capable of stepping up once again. En route to the stadium, the pack was overcome by the support it had received through the streets in Jacksonville. On the bus, you know, going to the stadium, you know, it was, it was really touching to see all the state fans. And uh, then the game was really special. When the Wolfpack took to the field for the first time, it was as if someone had moved the Gator Bowl to Carter-Finley Stadium as the color red dominated the double-deck facility. We came out for the game, and, I, and I, the first thing I did, I just looked around in the stands and I seen like 
red everywhere. It was just like, I felt like I had a, we was at a home game. And you know, I think we was the underdogs. So you, hey, that, that just got, that, that gave me more energy right there too. You're like, oh my gosh, I guess it's sitting in the Micron PC Bowl, is it? And then to walk into that stadium and see three quarters of it filled with red was really an unbelievable feeling. It, it, it really was. We seen all that red coming out of that tunnel, man. It, it just felt more uh, of a home game than sometimes playing in the quarter. It, it was totally all red, a sea of red, um, and many headlines said, and, and it just, you know, propelled us to go out there and play well. We wanted to play well in front of all that red and felt like a home game. We felt at home um, in Jacksonville and we knew it was going to be a great game for us. It's a home football game. We're in, we're in Raleigh, North Carolina, Carter Finley Stadium, and they're all rooting for you. The day was New Year's Day and NC State's New Year's resolution was to step up. Once again, the Wolfpack had its detractors and took the field as a clear underdog. We had a point to prove based on how we finished the season, but also how we had played the previous bowl game. And I knew on the team bus going in there, and I'm really all week long, that we were gonna play a tremendous football game. Notre Dame drew first blood when kicker Nick Setta put the Irish up three to nothing on a 23 yard field goal. And though the Irish would break out on top very quickly, it became obvious that the Pack's defense was ready to play the game of their lives as Manny Lawson and D'Antonio Burnett would alter how the Irish would play offense for the rest of the game. They completed a pass to about the three yard line and we had about 10 guys there make the tackle. But the sense was this, once the ball was there, all of a sudden now we, had, we were in a comfort zone. Notre Dame had mi been mixing up personnel, they had been doing some things that were out of character for them to get down the field in that drive. But when they get down to the goal line, they went to their goal line offense, which allowed us to go to our goal line defense. And as soon as they did that, we were right back into our comfort zone. On second and goal from the two yard line, the Iris sent quarterback Carlisle Holiday to the outside. We knew that they, since they saw that they couldn't run the ball straight at us, they were gonna try to run the option with the quarterback. And the play happened, the hole opened up, it was huge, it was a huge hose. Man, they lost and destroyed um, the fullback, and I seen him start to jump up in the air and I just, my eye just got big. I said, I'm gonna punish it now. And when he jumped up, I, I hit him right up on his shoulder and I heard him, he started groaning and stuff. And when he hit the ground, he tried to get up and went back down. I was like, oh yeah, I think this game might be over right now. You know, anytime you play a Midwestern team, they're gonna always try and out tough you. And there's a tendency to believe that the Southern teams are not quite as tough as those big Midwestern boys. And they found out on that play that a Chuck Amato coach football team is not going to be out tough. We may not win the game, but it's not going to be from a lack of toughness, and we're not going to be out hit. And the fact that on the same play, Manny knocked their fullback in the next week, and D'Antonio knocked their quarterback out of the game, Notre Dame knew on that play that they were in trouble. With Holiday sidelined for the rest of the afternoon, the Wolfpack would dominate the game on both sides of the ball. Phillip Rivers would get the ball rolling, driving his offense down the field with clock-like precision. Right out the gate, Phil was on fire, so when he's on fire, it's going to be a long day for the defense. We were just on fire, and uh, you know we had the crowd on our side. Uh, the defense was playing well with great emotion, and it was just uh, from that 98-yard drive through the rest of that first half, it was just kind of like we controlled the game. The long march would culminate in a two-yard T.A. McClendon score. McClendon would cross the goal line again, and Cotri would silence the Fighting Irish as NC State would go into halftime leading 21-3. In the second half, the Wolfpack defense would continue where it left off as Little U senior Rod Johnson became an unlikely defensive hero by single-handedly denying the Irish with three interceptions. He came up with some big plays, some big stops uh, when we needed. I think he got the first uh, interception of the game. He uh, jumped right in front of a pass. I think Arnaz Battle was right there. The quarterback was trying to throw it to him, and um, he jumped right in front of there. And then he just picked everything that was in the air from then on. But uh, that's just the type of player and character Rod uh, Johnson has. He's just going to be there when he's um, asked upon and, and do his job. And um, the Wolfpack faithful seeing that on, on that day. And, what a great way for him to go out and play. Allowing only one field goal per half, NC State capped off the game with a seven yard touchdown pass from Rivers to versatile tight end Sean Burton. The pack had come into the season with a winning attitude. It had also overcome a drought to post the most wins in school history. 
now with the Gator Bowl winding down and the outcome well in hand, it was time for Coach Amato to insert NC State's version of Rudy. You remember Rudy Rudinger, the famed Notre Dame player who never had a chance to get onto the field until the final game of his career. NC State had a similar player in Joe Sinford who got a chance in the spotlight with under a minute to play. Not only did Joe get on the field, he tipped a pass away and almost came up with a Gator Bowl interception. Everyone knows that everyone would have been out there on the field. We would have been picking him up. We may have carried him off on our shoulder. It would have been, it would have been so bad. But even on that play, um, it, I don't know if you see it or not, but Rod Johnson has a chance to come up with his fourth pick. As that ball is coming near his hands, everybody's on the sideline, is up in the air, and then he misses it and everybody comes down. So it was, it was unbelievable. If he picks that ball off, I think, you know, they may have had to stop the game for a while like they do in basketball. It would have been a great time for us. NC State had done it. It had defeated the Notre Dame Fighting Irish and had done so in convincing fashion, leaving Wolfpack players and coaches memories that will last a lifetime. To, to know after that Notre Dame game that we had accomplished our goal for the 2002 season, we had stepped up. Now when people think of NC State football, they think of it at a different level. We, we stood toe to toe and, and, and fought Notre Dame up in the trenches and, and won it, because that's why we won the game. Yeah, got a Gator Bowl ring. You know, I'm showing it off to them. You got one of those? <laughs> you know, do you have one? Yeah, do y'all have one? Yeah. NC State finished the season ranked 12th in the final ESPN USA Today poll and number 11 by the Associated Press, marking the highest final ranking in nearly three decades. And of course, that 11-3 record were the most wins by a Wolfpack football team in the 111-year history of the program. Of course, the fans could not get enough of this NC State team, and the excitement really showed during a downtown parade after the Gator Bowl. Uh, that was neat for us, uh, just seeing how, you know, even though it's a couple of days after, a week or so after, I don't remember exactly, but uh, all the fans and how excited they were uh, still about the win. You know, we you know, got to bus in and go up on the stage, and, and a lot of people actually turned out to uh, you know, show their appreciation for the great season and uh, show their support. And, uh, you know, the fans in general all year had a lot to do with our success. You know, uh, Car Finley 51-5 or whatever they say in seats, and it's, it's as loud as anywhere we go. And, uh, and from what I hear, you know, from talking to other players, they say, you know, coming here is a tough place to play. And, uh, you know, we owe a lot of credit to them for, for the success we have also. They gave us the keys to the city. You know, I'm going to give them the key to my heart. They're good people, man. They, NC State is a good place to be. The Wolfpack players and their fans had formed an enduring relationship that will continue to grow with the program. So the fans mean a lot to me, and I love them. And I love NC State fans. Although happy with his team's accomplishments and with being the 2003 Gator Bowl champs, Coach Amato still keeps his eyes on the big prize. But we still haven't won a championship. We haven't won a championship. We haven't won a conference championship. Oh, we've won a mythical state championship, but we don't get a ring for that. You see, we still haven't won a championship. We're getting better. We're getting better, just like this, these facilities are getting better but they're not finished yet. And there's a lot of work in both areas to be done. And with the support of the boosters and the alumni of this university and, and, the, and the hard work of these players and my coaches going out and recruiting and coaching the stew out of these young men, uh, it can happen. And with this building behind me now fully operational, along with the dedication of Coach Amato and his staff, it may happen sooner than you think. I'd like to thank you for watching this recap of what really was a spectacular season that saw an outstanding group of young men stepping up. For the entire Wolfpack family, I'm Tony Haynes, and go Pack!